Hi Peaceful Place friends, Teacher Mary here. Today we are going to be talking about a bird. And before I tell you what bird, I wanted to play a little guessing game with you. So let's think back to all the birds we know or have seen. Hmm. And by the time I give you these clues, you might guess what it is. If not, I'll give you the answer because we're gonna talk about it today anyways. All right, let's see. First hint, this bird has a long bill and this bird likes sweet, sweet nectar from flowers or a feeder. This bird got its name because its wings flap so fast that it makes a humming sound. They can be so colorful and beautiful to look at. Can you guess which bird I'm talking about? Hmm, you got it, the hummingbird. Today we're going to talk about hummingbirds and we're gonna learn where they live, we're gonna learn what they eat, and we're gonna learn about the different kinds of hummingbirds that live here in Washington State and the types that you might be most likely to see in your neighborhood. All right, so let's get started with our first item. We are going to talk about where hummingbirds live. I have a map here and it has the whole world on it. All the continents are here. So we've got North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, Antarctica. Can you guess where on this map the hummingbirds live? That's right. They live right here where I've highlighted it yellow. They only live here in North America and South America. And right here is called Central America. So that's where they also live. And do you know where we live? Where do we live on here? North America. Up here is North America. And I'm gonna bring this map closer to you so that you can see this red dot because you might not be able to see it from there. Can you see that? That red dot is where we live. Just about where we live. I tried to eyeball it. It's hard on a map that is, um, shows all the continents. So right here about is where we live. And we're gonna talk about what kinds of hummingbirds live in our state or the type of hummingbirds you might see if you have a hummingbird feeder at your home or flowers in your garden that attract them. So. There are four types of hummingbirds that live in Washington. And these are the four uh, most common that we might see. So I'm gonna scoot a little closer because I have them, uh, some pictures printed and I want you to be able to see them, okay? All right, so this first hummingbird, this is called Anna's hummingbird. Now this hummingbird lives here year round. It doesn't migrate, it stays here in Washington State. It is the largest hummingbird where we live. It's the most vocal, which means it produces a song that you can hear and most other hummingbirds are silent. So that's what makes this hummingbird special. And you can see two of them here. So this is the male and this is the female. You'll notice that they look pretty different, or the male looks more different because he's got some more colors on him. So I'm gonna get that in a little bit closer. The male has a dark rose red on the throat and on the crown of his head. His underside is mostly gray and his backside is mo uh, metallic or shiny green. And the female, she has a light gray chest, a white throat with reddish brown spots, and her backside that you can't really see in this picture has um, some brown and green as well. This is Anna's hummingbird, okay? Pretty cool, huh? All right, this next hummingbird, you can kind of tell by the way it looks. It's called black-chinned hummingbird. Now, this is the least common hummingbird in Washington State, um, but it can be seen flying around in March, which was last month, and all the way through July, so the end of summer. So for fall and winter, it'll migrate south. 
and I'll show you on that map. So we are up here, right? And when it becomes the winter months and gets cold, the bird will migrate down here to where Mexico is, where it's nice and warm pretty much year round. Okay, so let's talk about more about this black-chinned hummingbird. So again, you can see right over here is the male, and this is the female. The male has the purple on him. He's got black, a uh, black shimmering throat with purple towards the bottom, and a white body with dark brown spots and a little green on his backside, which you can't really see here. But you'll notice that the female has uh, mostly the same feather pattern all around. She's mostly light, um, but also has some dark browns. And on her back, she's got some green too. So I thought that was cool. I like the purple. Looks pretty cool. All right. The next hummingbird we're going to talk about is called the calliope humming hummingbird. Um, now the calliope hummingbird mostly nests in the mountains um, and migrates south, so down where I showed you earlier, uh, near Mexico. And you'll see that over here again, the one with the colorful feathers is the male, and this is the female. You see the male has those shiny purple feathers um, and has some green on his backside and a dark brown tail you can see at the bottom there. Now the female doesn't have those purple feathers. She just has a white throat um, and underside with some dark streaks in her feathers and a light brown chest and underside. So pretty cool, huh? Some, you can tell the difference uh, between the males and females pretty easy, right? All right, so I'm gonna show you this one. Now, which one do you think is the male? last few hummingbirds we've looked at, the male has had the more colorful throat area. So this one right here is the male and this is the female. So this is called the Rufus hummingbird. Now this hummingbird you can see around the month of February, which was a few months ago, and this hummingbird stays through the end of April. So. We're in April right now, and we're towards the end of April, so this hummingbird might get ready to migrate soon, uh, which means leave this area and uh, go down south to Mexico or Central America. Now, while this hummingbird is here, you will see this hummingbird in your gardens or at your feeder, and then they go to the mountains before they migrate south. So they're only here between February and April, just a couple of months. They head to the mountains for the rest of the summer, and then in winter, they go down south. So you'll see, like we pointed earlier, this is the male, and he has that shiny orange-red throat area right in here, and the female doesn't. She has a white throat with brown speckles, but they both have green on their backs and brownish feathers. Pretty cool, huh? So. Those are the four types that you will see in Washington State, and some of them will even show up in your neighborhoods, at your gardens, or at your bird feeders you might have at home, or sorry, hummingbird feeders, because it's different than regular bird feeders. These birds like nectar, the sweet sugary stuff that comes from flowers. All right. So next, I'm going to show you two different hummingbirds that don't live here, but I thought it was kind of cool because I'm going to show you the smallest hummingbird and the biggest hummingbird. And the ones that live here fall between there, more on the large side, not so much the tiny side. All right, so this one is called the bee hummingbird. And the bee hummingbird is the smallest hummingbird. Do you see that? It's on the tip of a pencil where the eraser is. And it's not much bigger than that. So you can kind of tell how small this little hummingbird has to be if he can sit right there on the tip of an eraser and not be much bigger than that. Pretty cool, huh? Now, this is the largest hummingbird. And hummingbirds don't get huge. They don't get really big. They're generally small bird. So this is the largest, and you can see a person's hand, a grown-up's hand, 
and it's just a little bit longer than that. And that's considered the biggest hummingbird. It's called the giant hummingbird. <laughs> so it's not super giant, but for, for hummingbirds it is. So I'll put those two up so they're next to each other. We have the tiniest hummingbird and the largest hummingbird. One is just about the size of the end of a pencil, and the other is the size of a grown-up's hand, all the way down to their wrists. Pretty cool. All right, and this picture I have shows you the tongue of a hummingbird, and I think you can see it right there. It's that white part that's sticking out from its bill. And I just thought it was cool because that's the part that um, goes in to lick up all the nectar uh, to eat from the flower. That's pretty cool. They have a little tongue that shoots out from that beak down into the flower where all the nectar is and eats it all up. All right, now we're gonna talk about what hummingbirds like to eat. Well, hummingbirds like to eat nectar and nectar is the sugary liquid that comes out of flowers and they like to eat this nectar. Do you wanna know how many times a day a hummingbird eats 10 to 15 times a day that is way more than we usually eat in a day right we usually have breakfast maybe a little snack lunch dinner maybe even a little extra snack but that's still only five times these hummingbirds eat up to 10 to 15 times a day that's a lot right especially for hummingbirds because they're really small, like you saw in some of the pictures. So these hummingbirds love nectar and they also will sometimes eat flying insects, but mostly it's just nectar they're after. And they can get nectar from flowers like we mentioned, or people will make what is just like nectar in a hummingbird feeder. And when you make your own hummingbird feeder, it's sugar and water. So it's still sugary and sweet and the hummingbirds like it and they'll come to your feeder and they'll eat it. Um, so I found some pictures of the different types of flowers that hummingbirds like the most. So I'm gonna show you those, all right? So some of these you might have in your garden. These are also flowers that you can plant in your garden if you have one. I personally don't have a garden so I would probably put out a hummingbird feeder that I can make from home and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, first I just want to show you some pictures of these flowers. So these are lupine. They're a beautiful purple flower. The types of flowers that hummingbirds are really drawn to or really like are bright, bright colorful flowers, especially reds and bright pinks and purples. If the hummingbird sees that, it'll go right to it and look for that nectar that's in there. All right, this next next one, sorry, get my picture ready, is called a trumpet honeysuckle. Trumpet honeysuckle. And hummingbirds, the types of flowers they usually like are uh, tubular type flowers, so flowers that kind of stick out, kind of like that center of the daffodil we were talking about a few weeks ago, um, like long flowers that stick out. And this one, you can see a little bit more close up that kind of tubular shape. This is called a foxglove. You see how the center is kind of deep in the flower. Those are the kind of flowers that hummingbirds like. So those ones are foxgloves. These ones they really like, and this grows really well in our state and where we live. This is called bee balm. Bee balm. It's pretty cool, right? A bright pink. And these ones are called fuchsias. Hummingbirds like the nectar that comes from fuchsias. Pretty great. All right, so we learned what hummingbirds like to eat. We found out where they live, and we talked about the different types of hummingbirds that live around us. Now, I'm gonna show you a clip, and there's gonna be two. The first one is going to be a video of a hummingbird going up to 
bee balm, and in this video it's more of a red color, so the hummingbird really likes that. Um, and we're going to get to see up close what it looks like when a hummingbird is eating at um, a flower that it likes. And then the second clip is going to show a hummingbird perched on a branch, so sitting on a branch, and we're going to get to hear what a hummingbird sounds like. And if you can remember, we talked about the Anna's hummingbird. And that's the hummingbird that we're going to see in our clip. And you're going to get to hear it. And hopefully in your neighborhood, maybe you'll get to hear it singing its beautiful song and spot it. All right. So we're going to take a look at those clips. And then we'll come back and talk more about hummingbirds. All right. Here's the clip of a hummingbird going up to each flower on this bee balm plant and you can see that it's going in and it's getting that nectar and going on to the next flower and the next one after that and did you know that hummingbirds are also like bees they pollinate too and so you can see this little bee going behind the hummingbird and seeing if there's any nectar left because they also help move pollen from flower to flower so this next clip is going to be an Anna's hummingbird, and we're going to get to hear what it sounds like when the hummingbird makes its call. Pretty cool, huh? I love watching videos where it shows hummingbirds going right up to a flower and getting to see it because sometimes if you spot one, uh, they get startled pretty easily, and if they notice you, then they fly away really quick. So, so it's nice to get to see a video where we can um, just see it up close without it flying away super quickly, right? Um, and also getting to hear what a hummingbird sounds like. Uh, so now that you've heard it, maybe when you're out for a walk, you can hear one in your neighborhood um, if they're around. All right, so I wanted to end this video with um, two things. One, I'm going to show you how to make a book of the types of hummingbirds we talked about today. And then we're gonna read a story together. All right, so, I made this, it's called My Book of Hummingbirds. And you can see my name down there, Mary, that's me. All right, so um, I will also send you um, a copy of these ones that are already colored so that you can look at them while you're coloring and make sure you get um, those special feathers that each of them have colored in there correctly. So. Here is my Anna's hummingbird. Pretty neat, huh? I used the pinks and there were some purples and some green in there. Let's see if I can find Anna's hummingbird in my pictures. Here we go. So you can tell that I uh, colored the male um, because of that pink that you see there looks pretty close, right? It's okay if it doesn't look exactly like a picture or exactly like mine, right? Just as long as you do your best. And this is to learn what the different types look like. So this one is Anna's hummingbird. The next one I have here is the black chinned hummingbird. And you can see his head is a darkish black color. I didn't do black exactly because I didn't want to hide the features, so I did it kind of light. And then you can see that purple that we saw in the picture from earlier. All right, so let's see if I got it right. I'm going to hold this up. There we go. Looks pretty close, huh? Did all right. But I can tell that it's the black chinned hummingbird especially by those features that I made sure to color correctly in the right places. All right, the next hummingbird we have in our book is the Rufus hummingbird. And let's see, this one right here, oops. 
here we go, the Rufus Hummingbird. You can kind of see right in there. I colored the male because he has the more colorful features. And look, there's bee balm in this picture. Not that that's the most important, but look, you're also next to bee balm in this picture, but it's a different color. It's more of a dark pink, but still pretty cool, huh? All right, and the last hummingbird we talked about that lives near us is the calliope, the calliope hummingbird. And you can see those purple feathers in the neck sticking out and up to underneath the bill. Those are the most noticeable features of the calliope hummingbird. All right, let's see. Looks pretty good, right? You can kind of tell, especially when you get those purple feathers colored in the right places. But of course, it doesn't look exact. So if you try this at home, just do your best. Um, get the colors out that you see in the picture and try and color it um, and get those special colors that they have in on your book. And then, once you're done, you can either write, trace, or cut and paste. You'll see the different options, the names. And then once you're all done, you'll have all your pages. Oops, got a couple upside down. And then, you'll have your cover, which says My Book of Hummingbirds. And you'll put that in front. And you'll have a grown-up or older sibling, or you can staple it to make a beautiful book of hummingbirds. All right. Well, thank you for joining me today and talking about hummingbirds. Hopefully you learned a few things. Um, I will be reading a book up next and I will see you guys later. Okay, bye. Today we're gonna read a book called Chrysanthemum. The day she was born was the happiest day of her parents' lives. She's perfect, said her mother. Absolutely, said her father. And she was, she was absolutely perfect. Her name must be everything she is, said her mother. Her name must be absolutely perfect, said her father. And it was Chrysanthemum. Her parents named her Chrysanthemum. Chrysanthemum grew and grew and grew. And when she was old enough to appreciate it, Chrysanthemum loved her name. She loved the way it sounded when her mother woke her up. She loved the way it sounded when her father called her for dinner, and she loved the way it sounded when she whispered it to herself in the bathroom mirror. Chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum. Chrysanthemum loved the way her name looked when it was written with ink on an envelope. She loved the way it looked when it was written with icing on her birthday cake. She loved the way it looked when she wrote it herself with her fat orange crayon. Chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum. Chrysanthemum thought her name was absolutely perfect, and then she started school. On the first day, Chrysanthemum wore her sunniest dress and her brightest smile. She ran all the way. Hooray, said Chrysanthemum, school! But when Miss Chud took roll call, everyone giggled upon hearing Chrysanthemum's name. It's too long, said Joe. It scarcely fits on your name tag, said Rita, pointing. I'm named after my grandmother, said Victoria. You're named after a flower. Chrysanthemum wilted. She did not think her name was absolutely perfect. She thought it was absolutely dreadful. The rest of the day was not much better. During nap time, Victoria raised her hand and informed Miss Claude that Chrysanthemum's name was spelled with 13 letters. That's exactly half as many letters as there are in the entire alphabet, Victoria explained. Thank you for sharing that with us, Victoria, said Miss Chud. Now put your head down. If I had a name like yours, I'd change it, Victoria said, as the students lined up to go home. I wish I could, thought Chrysanthemum miserably. Welcome home, said her mother. Welcome home, said her father. School is no place for me, said Chrysanthemum. My name is too long, it scarcely fits on my name tag, and I'm named after a flower. Oh, pish, said her mother. Your name is beautiful, and precious, and priceless, and fascinating, and winsome, said her father. 
it's everything you are, said her mother. Absolutely perfect, said her father. Chrysanthemum felt much better after her favorite dinner, macaroni and cheese with ketchup, and an evening filled with hugs and kisses and parcheesi. That night, Chrysanthemum dreamed her name was Jane. It was an extremely pleasant dream. The next morning, Chrysanthemum wore her most comfortable jumper. She walked to school as slowly as she could. She dragged her feet in the dirt. Chrysanthemum, 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 she wrote. She even looks like a flower, said Victoria as Chrysanthemum entered the playground. Let's pick her, said Rita, pointing. Let's smell her, said Joe. Chrysanthemum wilted. She did not think her name was absolutely perfect. She thought it was absolutely dreadful. The rest of the day was not much better. During nap time, Victoria raised her hand and said, A chrysanthemum is a flower. It lives in a garden with worms and other dirty things. Thank you for sharing that with us, Victoria, said Miss Chud. Now put your head down. I just cannot believe your name, Victoria said as the students lined up to go home. Neither can I, thought Chrysanthemum miserably. Welcome home, said her mother. Welcome home, said her father. School is no place for me, said Chrysanthemum. They said I even look like a flower. They pretended to pick me and smell me. Oh, pish, said her mother. They're just jealous and envious and begrudging and discontented and jaundiced, said her father. Who wouldn't be jealous of a name like yours, said her mother. After all, it's absolutely perfect, said her father. Chrysanthemum felt better after her favorite dessert, chocolate cake with buttercream frosting, and an evening filled with hugs and kisses and parcheesi. That night, Chrysanthemum dreamed that she really was a chrysanthemum. She sprouted leaves and petals. Victoria picked her and plucked her leaves and petals one by one until there was nothing left but scrawny stem. It was the worst nightmare of Chrysanthemum's life. Chrysanthemum wore her outfit with seven pockets the next day. She looked, or she loaded the pockets with her most prized possessions and her good luck charms. Chrysanthemum took the longest route possible to school. She stopped and stared at each and every flower. Chrysanthemum, 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 the flowers seemed to say. That morning, the students were introduced to Miss Twinkle, the music teacher. Her voice was like something of a dream and was everything else about her. The students were speechless. They thought Miss Twinkle was an incredible wonder. They went out of their way to make a nice impression. Miss Twinkle led the students in scales. Then she assigned roles for the class musical. Victoria was chosen as the dainty fairy queen. Rita was chosen as the spiffy butterfly princess. Joe was chosen as the all-important pixie messenger. And Chrysanthemum was chosen as a daisy. Chrysanthemum's a daisy? Chrysanthemum's a daisy! Joe, Rita, and Victoria chanted, thinking it was wildly funny. Chrysanthemum wilted. She did not think her name was absolutely perfect. She thought it was absolutely dreadful. What is so humorous? asked Miss Twinkle. Chrysanthemum was the answer. Her name is so long, said Joe. It scarcely fits on her name tag, said Rita, pointing. I'm named after my grandmother, said Victoria. She's named after a flower. My name is Long, said Miss Twinkle. It is, said Joe. My name would scarcely fit on a name tag, said Miss Twinkle. It would, said Rita, pointing. And, Miss Twinkle said, I'm named after a flower, too. You are, said Victoria. Yes, said Miss Twinkle. My name is Delphinium, Delphinium Twinkle. And if I, my baby is a girl, I'm considering Chrysanthemum as a name. I think it's absolutely perfect. Chrysanthemum could scarcely believe her ears. She blushed, she beamed, she bloomed. 
Chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum. Joe, Rita, and Victoria looked at Chrysanthemum longingly. Call me Marigold, said Joe. I'm Carnation, said Rita, pointing. My name is Lily of the Valley, said Victoria. Chrysanthemum did not think her name was absolutely perfect. She knew it. Wasn't that a great story? Thank you for joining me today, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time. Bye now.